technology both saves our lives and makes us crazy. These days, of course, we're going through the debate yet again over vaccine passports, necessary evil that gives us easier access to travel, events, and people, or a frightening intrusion into our privacy, allowing governments, airlines, even restaurants to access our health information and track our every movement. Our guest today knows well the world of technology and how it intersects with privacy and free speech. Daphne Keller directs the program on platform regulation at Stanford's Cyber Policy Center. She earlier served as Associate General Counsel for Google. Her work focuses on legal protections for users' free expression rights, free speech. So I will, of course, be asking her about two pieces of very troubling legislation here in Canada that will be back on deck given the Liberals' return to power, bills that restrict free speech and allow for government censorship. Daphne is both an historian who studied modern culture and media and holds a JD in intellectual property from Yale. That is a Doctor of Laws degree. And we have reached her in San Francisco today. Daphne, it's just, it's a thrill and an honor to have you with us. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's just, uh, you're you're one of the, the North Americas, if not the world's experts on this. Now, I was reading an essay that you wrote, and it raises questions that are so um, key today. You were talking about uh, a Texas newspaper who, leading up to July 4th celebrations in your country, posted sections of the Declaration of Independence. And of course, there is language in there um, that uh, provokes people. And so Facebook promptly took it down. So it's not only are we toppling statues today, but we're toppling the written and verbal equivalent. And, and, and you being a historian saw the irony that the words of Thomas Jefferson were now being censored. Is that where we're at? Well, yes. I mean, where, where we are at is that platforms are being charged with enforcing nuanced speech rules and they are making mistakes all the time, given the, the scale of what we're asking them to do. And, you know, the problem isn't that all speech should always be legal. The problem is that every country has some speech that they prohibit, be it defamation or uh, child abuse hate material. Speech. We have hate speech laws. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and, and and we all draw different lines. And as long as they're within the parameters of international human rights, you know, all, all of those are fine. The problem that I see arises when we take these nuanced legal rules and then we outsource them to private companies and say, hey, you're in trouble if you don't enforce this right, go forth and take things down. And so we see them doing things like deploying automation um, that is clumsy and catches the wrong things and takes it down. Uh, and this may not ever get corrected. Uh, and it, it's a problem for speech, as you point out, there's also a disparate impact problem. You know, there was a Wall Street Journal coverage just this past week of um, a gentleman, he was the former head of BBC's Arabic news service, whose posts criticizing Osama bin Laden were taken down by Facebook's automation. Um, and then a human supposedly reviewed it, but they just rubber stamped what the automation did. And he got silenced on the eve of an important live event. You know, there's a real, there's a disparate impact concern in who gets silenced. There's also a privacy concern in how these technologies are deployed. But criticizing o Osama bin Laden, uh, a terrorist, 9-11, we all know the connections there, because somehow the algorithms determined that that was anti-Muslim or what triggered it? Presumably. I mean, what, what these algorithms are doing is looking for things like combinations of words. Um, and they are very bad at knowing if a particular word or an image or a video that might be used in a pro-extremist context in one place mm -hmm. is reappearing in another place as journalistic coverage or academic analysis or counter speech or parody. You know, to a computer, those things look the same. And right. so we see errors all the time with the wrong things being taken down. There was a terrible example where YouTube took down the entire archive 
of uh, documentation of war crimes and abuses from an NGO called the Syrian Archive in Germany, presumably, again, because the, the machines can't tell the difference between violent imagery used to do serious harm in the world and the same right. imagery used for really important public purposes. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, as your Supreme Court and others have said, this is the modern public square. This is how people communicate and how we consume information and news and form opinions and become citizens in our respective democracies. Can we actually rule this and impose rules on it? Or are we back to the Noam Chomsky view of the world, which is free speech is the right to see and hear speech that we disagree with? I think we, we can and we do impose rules on private platforms. Uh, you know, as I said, every country has some speech that they prohibit. And most countries uh, require platforms to take down some or all of that speech. There's, you know, variation in, in how it's done. Um, but I think the idea that we can take all of the human behavior and interaction and casual speech and, you know, ordinary people's online lives, which have become basically, you know, our whole lives almost in, in the age of COVID, mm -hmm. the idea that we can regulate that by putting some simplistic obligations onto private companies whose incentive always is going to be pr to protect themselves by, by taking down too much content. Um, you know, that is a, a hubristic <laughs> idea yes, of, yes. of how, you know, human lawmaking and, and regulation can work. And they are conflicted. They're in the business of making money and promoting, promoting their own platforms. So they're not exactly objective in this process. Right. They're in the business of doing what makes advertisers happy, you know, right. is, is one bottom line. You were writing something in August, which I read last night, in which you summed up the current situation that we are discussing here by saying things are crazy, which I thought was a very insightful comment. And there is more going on than anyone could possibly keep up with. And that both politics or that politics rather than law actually are shaping uh, the debate and controlling the direction we're going to. That is frightening. It's so hard. You know, there's a community internationally of hundreds, maybe thousands of people who really are experts on this and, and have mm -hmm. been thinking about platforms and speech regulation. Um, and they're all just spread so thin that we barely have enough people engaging with any one political process because there's the Digital Services Act in Europe and there's the online safety bill in the UK and there's this proposal in Canada. Canada is very fortunate to have a handful of really great Canadian legal experts paying attention. Uh, there's Michael Geist, who, who I know yes. you, you know. Uh, there's uh, Vivek Krishnamurthy at the University of Ottawa is excellent on this. Emily Laidlaw has written really insightfully about how defamation law can work on the internet. So, you know, it's not that Canada lacks the experts to weigh in on this. It's that the political process so far seems to have ignored them. Well, let's uh, delve into, because I know um, through your own work and, and work with Michael Geist, uh, who has been a guest with us here uh, on a couple of occasions, you understand what we're talking about. But just let me recap. The Canadian government proposed two pieces of legislation before the election. And it, a lot of the experts that I've read say this would make us a country with the most severe restrictions on users, free speech, and on platforms, and would establish a digital safety commissioner to police online activity. You have to know, Daphne, that in Canada, we use benign language to camouflage the real intent. We call our Homeland Security Department public safety. So you kind of get my meaning about the language we use. So the digital safety commissioner, this is going to be people appointed by government to decide what stands and what doesn't on these uh, online platforms. The bill was actually sold as a way to protect 
Canadian content that through discoverability rules, you could go in and make sure that we weren't being overwhelmed by things south of the border. And the safety side supposedly was to protect us from hate speech, but we already have uh, laws on the books. What troubled everybody in the end was the minister responsible kind of let the cat out of the bag by stating, and I'm quoting here, the rules must be consistent with the government's vision and represent the government's broad intention and so-called harmful, harmful content. And again, I quote, that would be content that diminishes public institutions or ridicules politicians. Help me wow. learn. <laughs> <laughs> Just go with that, will you? <laughs> that That is remarkable. And I mean, to be honest, that's not something that I could see on the face of the document proposing this, because it seemed to be saying, let's take the existing laws against violent content and hate speech and so forth, and then do a little bit of a translation. And it's not clear mm -hmm. if it's saying expand them, prohibit currently lawful speech, or mm -hmm. saying you know, just translate them and have it be the same rules. Um, and, and so it's, you can't tell on, on the face of, of the proposal um, right. how much it is shifting uh, power to, you know, government actors acting in their own interests, as, as that quote suggests. Right. So how do you, in that world, as you say, where this whole discussion has been politicized, it's it's more obvious in, in your country because we see the relationship between Silicon Valley and 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 the Democratic Party and and the even Jen Psaki the other day talking about, you know, how they communicate with Facebook and Google and have these conversations and tell them what should be uh, censored as if that were a normal thing to do. <laughs> it, it's remarkable. And I think it's one of the, um, the great changes of our age uh, that these private entities are in a position to be able to carry out a degree of censorship or surveillance that was just never possible physically for anyone to do before. And because they're private entities, they are not, at least under US law, um, bound to respect users' rights, their speech rights or their rights to privacy in the same way that the government would be. And so if the government can outsource surveillance and censorship work to private companies, and the users have no, no recourse and no rights protection because the violation wasn't technically done by the government, that's a catastrophe for human rights. And so the, the thing that is so important to navigate and that we're slowly figuring out, um, and I wrote about this in an article called, Who Do You Sue? The question, if you're the mm -hmm. user, can you sue the government? Can you sue the private platform? You know, We have to figure out how to navigate this strange new hybrid of state and private power and identify how users' rights to speech, to equality before the law, to due process, to privacy, to all of these things. You know, how are those rights going to be protected in this new world? But that's the issue. I mean, when they're private entities, as we've mentioned, they have their own private interests, monetary included, uh, but pleasing the political masters who will also make legislation that might affect their lives. So that's over there. On the other hand, as individuals, we really don't want governments deciding what we can say to whom and when. Well, and I, I think a real way that this can play out in practice is the government or even duly enacted laws says, hey, you have to take down the following and platforms say, that's really complicated and we don't wanna get in trouble for messing it up. And so we're just going to use our terms of service to prohibit an even wider margin of speech beyond that so that we have a simple rule and we're sure we're not going to get in trouble. And, and so the dynamic is that pressure from governments to take down speech begets privatized rules that take down even more speech to simplify things. And, and that moves even more decisions of, of, you know, about our rights out of courts or legislatures or public forums and into this sort of you know, black box inside a private company. Negotiations between these two parties, the private sector and governments, to protect their respective um, behinds. And, and we're somehow in the middle uh, with, hello, we need, we need to be able to say what we think and write about issues that are important. Right. 
Right. And, and the proposal in Canada has a couple of provisions that are just, as you said, it kind of combines the worst things that we've seen in other proposals around the world. So, for example, it has an obligation for platforms to respond to legal accusations. If somebody says, hey, that person is sharing illegal speech, the platform has just 24 hours to decide whether to take it down which is Way a recipe too, for, yeah. you know, <laughs> just taking it down to, to avoid yeah. risk. You know, nobody really can do real legal analysis in, in that short period of time, but the only companies that he can even attempt to do so are the biggest incumbents, the Facebooks, the Googles, et cetera, of the world. And so it also creates a real anti-competitive dynamic where, where there's a mandate that the giant, you know, entrenched companies can comply with and their smaller competitors probably can't. Uh, there were some Facebook um, revelations in the last couple of weeks about their behavior and some internal mem memos that said, you know, just keep saying what we say publicly, but know that we're not doing that internally. Um, this is the kind of thing that's very scary because they are deciding what face, Facebook posts stay up or whose accounts get canceled. Yeah, and I, those the articles are are remarkable uh, and and well worth reading. They really illustrate the need for better transparency about what's going on inside of platforms. And so the the platform regulation proposals that I'm seeing that I think are most useful are things like in the Digital Services Act in, in the EU, there are robust transparency mandates, both for sharing information with the public, but also for more sensitive information that, that can't necessarily be publicized for having mechanisms for academic researchers to go in and dig around and figure out if you know platforms aren't doing what they're saying or if they're trying to do what they said, but they're making a bunch of mistakes and not even noticing it. Um, you know, we really need independent eyes on these questions and, and relying on whistleblowers to deliver troves of documents to the Wall Street Journal is not the right mechanism. Yeah, that's I, I guess that's the fundamental question. Of course, we need more eyes on this and we can't be making snap decisions based on one person's complaint that in the next 24 hours, you're going to rip information out of the system. But I mean, there are literally billions of posts every hour <laughs> uh, globally. I mean, there's just, it, it's going to have to be left to algorithms who, which have their own built-in biases. Certainly. Well, it doesn't have to be left to them. <laughs> it is being left to them in large part because of legal and political and public pressure on platforms to act faster and take down more content swiftly. Um, and we all need to recognize that creating that pressure always creates these trade-offs. Uh, there is always collateral damage. It is predictable what kinds of collateral damage there will be in things wrongly removed. And the the correct response to that, I think, legislatively is to slow down and say, hey, OK, you know, if we know that this is the trade off, we're going to create this damage. Is it worth it? Or yeah. is there a way that we can better design the law to minimize that damage, um, which sometimes can involve things like, you know, letting users appeal takedown decisions, but allowing appeals will never be enough in the face of the kind of substantial over removal um, that's incentivized by things like the Canadian proposal. You know, we know that people in positions of more vulnerable people are less likely to bother mm -hmm. appealing. Um, you know, there's studies showing that women, for example, are less likely to appeal unfair takedowns. Um, and in the Canadian proposal, there's this additional really Orwellian element where platforms have to report users to law enforcement if they are suspected of particular kinds of, of you know, speech crimes. Um, and and it, this sounds like that, China. It's making me very nervous. <laughs> it's it's really it's really alarming. I mean, you, you combine that with the concerns about disparate impact, about people of color being reported to the police more and then being mistreated in the hands of the police. You know, it 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 is not a good mechanism, and it's certainly not something to rush to adopt because somebody thought of it and it seemed like a good idea. This really needs a slowdown and consultation 
with the kinds of people we've been talking about. No, and we're having some kind of very quiet consultation behind closed doors during the course of an election campaign, which is, of course, precisely not the time uh, to do that. Let me go on a little tangent for a moment, because it's in a way kind of the flip side of this, the right to be forgotten uh, rulings where your histories and sometimes incorrect histories stay online forever. Uh, and you can't appear to do anything about it. Google just lost its um, appeal to the courts in Canada, uh, its appeal for an exemption so that they wouldn't be subject to that. Where, where does that fit into this, getting genuinely incorrect information off your online history? So I actually, I did some filings um, on the, on these proposals in Canada a couple of years ago, but but I haven't tracked it since then. And mm -hmm. you know, just in full disclosure, I was at Google when the EU's yes. right to be forgotten ruling came down and, and was very involved in that. You know, my my personal opinion is it is fine and legitimate for national laws to protect people's privacy and to say there is certain uh, information that users should have a right to request removal, um, but the mechanics of how that can work are really important. You know, you don't want it to become a way that any, you know, a politician can suppress um, truthful information about themselves. You don't want it to become a way that the Me Too movement disappears because every man whose name has been mentioned says, oh, I have a privacy right to, right. to take this information down. And I think um, that the Canadian proposal really went about this um, badly. Uh, because it built on the it built on Pepita on sort of what I think is the the wrong area of law. Instead of taking the rich history of privacy law that has been weighed against free expression concerns and things like cases against newspapers, it right. sort of used this other mechanism that didn't have the same sort of of, of built in protections and and weighing of values. So I I was quite troubled um, by that development. But the underlying goal saying there's some content that comes down on privacy grounds, that's, you know, that's fine. That's something that is up to uh, national lawmakers and the Charter of Rights and, you know, a, a population to decide what balance it wants to strike between expression and privacy there. And, and it's not just privacy. I mean, it's, it's, if it's incorrect, you know, in that context, as we were discussing earlier, uh, I want the ability to have that come down. But, you know, one man's <laughs> issue is another woman's sense of free speech. So it's a really hard uh, balance. It's really hard. And it's something that you want courts to do. You know, <laughs> these yeah. are trade offs that are made in defamation law. These are trade offs yeah. that are made in traditional privacy law. We do have a you know, a history of, of figuring these things out. Um, but they're, they're hard calls and, and they should be made by courts, not by private companies. Yeah. So on the case, as we've seen in the States, because regardless of what you think about um, Donald Trump and his tweets and his postings, having a company take down the president of the United States Twitter feed and and his friends and associates and taking down entire platforms or essentially bankrupting them parlor. Um, this raises questions because these same outfits took down stories about the origins of COVID-19 that were earlier deemed to be conspiracy theories, which now are deemed to be fact-based journalism or even Hunter Biden's laptop. I mean, it it changes as more information comes out. So that timing issue becomes even more crucial. Yeah. So I actually think this at heart is a competition problem. You know, if we had 25 competing Facebooks uh, or right. 10 competing versions of Twitter and they all had different content policies, then there would be adequate alternate you know, places to go to say things that one of them doesn't like. Um, and so, you know, we've gotten ourselves into this mess in, in part through the consolidation that has landed us with such a small number of corporations having bottleneck control over such a huge part of our, 
um, public discourse, you know, of the, you know, equivalent of the public square, although that's a right. pretty complicated and, and loaded metaphor. Um, and so I, I, I think the first place to look for remedies lies more in competition and diversifying what we can say and where, rather than saying, okay, we accept that there are just a few giants and now we, we have to get the perfect speech rules for them. Yeah. That's the problem, though, because given their massive uh, presence at this point, you don't want to be the startup in that world trying to compete with Google as a platform or, you know, Twitter or Facebook. Yeah. So the, there are some very interesting proposals out there. Um, Francis Fukuyama at Stanford has written about yeah. this as middleware. Um, Cory Doctorow and Mike Masnick were writing some really good things about this going back several years with the idea that you know, maybe a mo there should be an unbundling model where you say, okay, Twitter, you know, you continue to host all of this information, but you aren't the only one offering content moderation or, you know, ranking of the newsfeed. Users can say, no, I want the uh, a version of content moderation layered on top of it that comes from my church or that comes from a Black Lives Matter associated group or that comes from Disney or from ESPN. You know, if you could bring in competition at that layer um, for different speech rules to be available for users to opt into, that could be a really important first step in moving away from this just consolidation of control over speech that, that we're facing. I, I like that idea. And then it also raises in my own mind that general question, which is increasingly we're all living in echo chambers, which is um, being on Twitter or Facebook only with people that we agree with and, and how these giant things, uh, these, these companies are contributing to the polarization that we're seeing in our society. Yeah, I mean, that one is, a, it's a complicated question. I, I have a lot of colleagues who work on just the empirical research on this, and, and they are increasingly saying, oh, that echo chambers story is not quite borne out by the facts. Um, but it's still That's something to worry about. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's sort of encouraging. I mean, we seem to have a major problem whether or not <laughs> that yeah. is exactly the root of, of the problem. But but it's kind of hard as a society to get away from the fact that, you know, people are going to choose which cable news service they watch. They're going to choose which right. newspaper they read. You know, there is always a certain amount of opting, um, you know, to listen to people you agree with. Mm -hmm. um, and there's it is usually not the role of government to come in and say, hey, no, you, you can't opt for this. You have to sort of, you know, eat your veggies metaphorically. You have to listen to these other things that you didn't want to listen to. Um, so I, I find that issue really complicated and difficult, you know, at thinking about what the role the law can have um, in, yeah. in addressing things like echo chambers. But focusing on letting me as an individual decide what layers of uh, filtering I want on the material uh, I see or what or what kind of direction. I mean, send me only sports stories. I'm sick and tired of politics kind of thing. Um, right. And, and, and this is something, you know, that could be grounded in competition. You can also ground it in user privacy. You know, you can say, um, if you are giving your data to a company, you have the right to say how it is used and that extends to rights to you know set the dials and knobs of what kind of content you want to see um, and and maybe even which providers of ranking services or content moderation services you want to opt into so that there are ways to get there that start from user autonomy and control sort of a bottom-up approach rather than starting from the government saying here's what you can and can't look at the sort of top-down approach could, could you write a memo to our guys about that? Because that would be <laughs> useful to get them thinking about that. I'll uh, get right on that. A <laughs> couple of other points here. Um, Section 230 in, in the U.S., which is just referred to as Section 230, so I feel like we have to explain it a little bit. Part of the um, Communications Decency Act um, to shield platforms, so the big guys again, from liability. What needs to happen there? I can think of things that, you know, if they gave me the pen and let me tweak it, I mm -hmm. might tweak it. 
But what we are seeing in Congress right now is a lot of proposals that are really throwing spaghetti at the wall, making things up, you know, not thinking through what the consequences will be. And so I've, I'm, I'm very worried ab about what can happen. Um, for example, um, you know, if you think about like, what are some obvious things you would want to do in a platform regulation? Well, one thing is not to assume everyone is Facebook. You know, if, mm -hmm. if, you, if you are passing certain laws that you think make sense for giant consumer facing platforms, that's fine, but say that. Don't take rules that make sense for Facebook or make sense for YouTube and say every entity, no matter how small, has to comply with them. Or say that other technical layers in the internet's infrastructure all have to comply with them. You don't want the same rules to apply to an right. ISP or to apply to um, a domain name service provider or a Cloudflare. You know, th there are companies that are basically connecting and transmitting giant amounts of data and who are not in the content moderation business. And if we put them in the content moderation business, they basically have only very blunt tools, you know, to take down an entire website instead of an individual comment, for example. And I, I bring that up as an example, just because so yep. many of the proposals here in the US don't even think of that, you know, they're blind to this really basic thing. And the same is true in the Canadian proposal. It, yeah. it proposes these extremely blunt rules um, that again, seem designed for Facebook, but it doesn't differentiate which other entities in the internet ecosystem might really be poorly suited to those rules. You, you noted in one of your pieces that, um, interestingly enough, and it's kind of counterintuitive that your two main, your conservatives and your Democrats have kind of changed positions uh, on these whole issues. Explain that to our listeners here. It's, it's remarkable. And, and it gets back to this idea of um, major platforms functioning as the, the public square. Um, yeah. And so, you know, it, they, we have increasingly Republicans who are concerned that platforms are silencing conservative voices um, with or without factual foundation. It's, it's very hard to tell without better transparency, um, right. saying the government should force these private companies to carry speech they don't want to. Um, this is very contrary to more traditional Republican positions that don't want the government basically, you know, confiscating private companies' resources to force them to, to do new things. And, and specifically for many years, decades, um, Republicans in the U.S. opposed the fairness doctrine uh, for broad broadcast uh, providers and similar rules for, for cable companies that were the same thing, that were the government coming along and telling private companies what content they needed to carry. Um, and, and the concern most often voiced by Republicans at the time is similar to the point you were raising earlier. It's that this becomes a mechanism for the regulator, the, in our case, the Federal Communications Commission, um, which has political appointees um, right. heading it. It becomes a mechanism for them to put their thumb on the scales and, and shape public discourse in a way that is the government acting, but the, that is invisible to people. And so it's just, it's very interesting and, and I don't think there's exactly a right or wrong side to this debate. It's a hugely complex debate, but politically it's very interesting to see Republicans flip sides and now say, oh, but if we're talking about internet platforms, then the government should intervene and tell them which speech they need and, to carry. And Democrats wanting more constraint, more uh, restrictions on free speech, more takedowns. Uh, this is, I guess, partly to do with when you're in power and when you're not, you have a very different vantage point. Yeah. I mean, broadly speaking, many of the democratic proposals to change CDA 230 are about making platforms take down more user speech. And many of the Republican proposals are about making platforms take down less user yeah. speech. And you know, it's hard to find political consensus to actually pass something in that situation. Um, but, and, and I, you know, I would just add, I don't think this is innately partisan. You know, it's, it's how yeah. the politics happen to be playing out in the U.S. right now. But there are plenty of people you would think of as, you know, more politically on the left um, who feel that their groups are being unfairly silenced. You know, there are Muslim right. rights organizations and gay rights organizations and black rights organizations saying, hey, 
you know, we're being unfairly silenced. We want to force the platforms to stop treating us unfairly and to carry our speech. So, you know, it happens to be a right time, issue now. They're so. asking for sections of the, you know, U.S. Constitution to be taken down. Right? It's, it's kind of... <laughs> it's a big mess. Yes, it is. Okay, so two final points here. Is it hopelessly naive to believe that the test of our democracy is freedom of citizens to criticize leaders, to do battle with bad ideas on all of these platforms by offering better ones. And if you don't like what you hear, change the channel or shut it off. Has that notion of free speech just become too naive in the world of Google and Facebook, et cetera, et cetera? I hope that's not too naive. You know, if we give up on a world where citizens can speak truth to power, you know, yeah. where we all debate and disagree with our government and, you know, use that as the basis for our vote in the next election, I don't know what we're left with. You know, I, I don't see um, a future where we say, we can't trust individuals to have this kind of debate. So we need to hand massive power to a big company or to a government to really restrict that. Um, that does not sound like a positive future to me. So, you know, while, as I've said a couple of times, there are plenty of legally legitimate reasons to tell platforms to take right. down particular content, the huge broad stroke um, powers both for private companies and, and for the government in the Canadian proposal are a huge step past that. They, they are something new and different and truly alarming. Who, if anyone, is doing it right in the world? Well, I have been pointing to uh, Brussels, to the EU level government of Europe for a while on that. It's not that I agree with everything they do. I, right. you know... <laughs> published many things stating what I disagree with, but I, I did. I, had I an read some of them. <laughs> <laughs> I had an op-ed in The Hill, which is a sort of um, U.S. legislator focused, Congress focused yeah. publication in January saying, I thought the U.S. should emulate the EU in a couple of aspects of the Digital Services Act, um, which is the, the big piece of legislation they're working on right now. So one is um, differentiating between different kinds of internet technologies and not regulating them all with one broad stroke, as, as we discussed right. earlier, you know, dif differentiating by size, by technical function. Uh, the, the second is distinguishing what's a competition issue, what's a privacy issue, what's a speech issue, and using the right legal toolkit to address each of those things instead of garbling them together in a way that lose, loses sight of the lessons and expertise and legal doctrines that come from those distinct areas of law. Um, and then the third is just looking very closely at the real world information we have about how content moderation works. You can't pass laws, you can't pass good laws based on a fantasy of how platforms are going to moderate the content. You have to look at the research showing, you know, the vast number of false accusations they receive, the vast amount of error and over removal that happens, even under laws that try to disincentivize that. Uh, the problems with relying on automation, which, you know, the literature is stacking up. Uh, about those problems. You have to look at those things and, and the real world facts and legislate on that basis rather than doing what seems to be happening in Canada, unfortunately, which is making up something that sounds good on paper, but just doesn't correlate to how this is going to play out in the real world. Daphne, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to make sure as many people as possible hear your comments uh, on this podcast today because we are headed into that debate and it's it's um, very direct and very, very helpful. So uh, we may be back to you again <laughs> to offer us guidance. <laughs> thank, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Daphne Keller directs the program on platform regulation at Stanford Cyber Policy Center. And she also once worked as Associate General Counsel for Google. So she knows a lot of these issues that concern users' free expression rights. That is it for No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye.